Good evening, everybody. For everybody just signing in at the moment, uh, we'll be starting shortly. I was going to let everybody join us uh, and we'll get going in a moment. Good evening for those that are joining. Pardon a bit of silence. We're just waiting for a few more to join us uh, this evening for our webinar. So we'll start in about a minute or so and just wait for some of the latecomers to come on. Okay, I think we're going to get going. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on a shocking approach to managing myofascial pain with Ken Johnson. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, and we hope you are excited to learn something new with Ken. Uh, this evening's webinar is going to be split into two sections. Uh, Ken is going to present on the subject, and then we're going to move into a question and answer section at the end. So if there's anything you want to ask, um, you have the question and answer function at the bottom of the screen that you can use there. Now, this session is being recorded, which you'll get access to in the next couple of days. I uh, will follow this session up with a survey and the recording. Uh, so if you've got any questions, please feel free to put them in now. But if you do have any after the session, you can ask us uh, then as well. So some quick introductions. My name's Dominic Smith. I'm the clinical application specialist at PhysiQuip. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with PhysiQuip, um, we are a UK based medical uh, technology distribution company who work with uh, many of our international colleagues, uh, Ken being one of those, uh, to bring some of the latest healthcare um, technology and advancements to the UK. So let me introduce Ken. Uh, Ken is from uh, the United States of America. He's the director of outpatients at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, Baltimore uh, in the States. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you on, Ken. I'm really excited to learn a little bit of, of what you guys do over, over the pond. Uh, but with all that being said, Ken, I'm gonna hand over to you and you can start the presentation. Very good, Dom, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you all for taking time out of your evening to. To, to join us and uh, look forward to sharing with you some of uh, my thoughts and ideas, experiences, and uh, hopefully we will end in a, a meaningful discussion uh, and question and answer session at the very end. Um, feel free to ask questions anytime, uh, if appropriate, I'll try to stop and, and answer as we go, otherwise we'll catch them at the end. Um, so, uh, that, that's me, my name, obviously. Um, here in Baltimore today, I don't know if you can see out my window, um, but it is snowing. So uh, I'm hopeful to uh, have, have a few inches of snow today uh, by the close of this, this talk. As far as our agenda goes, um, we'll be first talking uh, with a, just a, sort of a general introduction to the concept of, of shockwave. I know shocking, we're gonna be talking about shockwave today. Um, but also talk about some of the uh, physiological and methodological framework uh, behind it and how it fits into to our practice here. You know, we'll support what we talk about with, with evidence, but at the same point, you know, try not to make it too heavy. It's hard to fit a lot into a short period of time. Uh, as Dom mentioned, this talk will be recorded and you can always go back and zoom in if you missed a slide or wanna see uh, where I was presenting from. We'll talk then about some of the indications, contraindications, some of the different clinical applications and uh, considerations for use uh, as you are looking to integrate um, shockwave into your clinical practice. In terms of, um, you know, there, there's so much uh, information out there um, as well. There's a lot in social media. So in terms of fancy applications, I'll, I'll show you just a couple, um, but uh, just from time constraints, we'll, we'll limit that uh, to just a few. Um, let me find the right button. As far as disclosures, uh, I have no relevant financial interest, whether in PhysiQuip or Elvation. Uh, it's one of the, the technologies we'll be talking about today. Um, that is what it is, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, my role is the director of 
uh, outpatient rehabilitation therapy services for Johns Hopkins Hospital and Johns Hopkins Rehabilitation Network here in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, we have 10 locations and approximately 120 uh, physical, occupational, and speech language pathologists that uh, provide care on my team. Uh, and we cover um, facilities largely in the Baltimore, Washington area, although we do have affiliations with uh, hospital clinics in Florida and um, also in the Middle East. So pain, uh, pain is, a, a, as you all know, it's a very uh, challenging uh, thing that we address uh, every day as a therapist um, or clinician. Uh, there's a number of different factors that can complicate uh, the, the pain presentation in a patient. Uh, they can be developmental, physiologic, social, psychological, cultural, uh, and even dietary. So uh, depending on you know, how we're genetically predisposed, uh, the stresses that we're under, uh, the social, socioeconomic factors that we may be facing at any given time. You know, all of these uh, are, are, some are inherent and other are variable and they can compound and complicate um, the, our task at hand, which is ultimately trying to help alleviate pain and improve movement and improve function. That leads us to fascia. So fascia being uh, the framework upon which um, you know our body is built upon. I mean, we've got uh, fascia layers that run uh, and, and connect every organ, every muscle, um, every nerve fiber. It, it it runs from dermis to to periosteum. So you know, there's a number of people that have discussed a number of different. Um, uh, fascial theories in terms of how fascia can be contractile, non-contractile, how it can <clears throat> be aligned, or organized in, um, you know, pathways or anatomy trains, as, as Meyer calls them. You know, they all can be very helpful in understanding how a movement restriction uh, can lead to overuse in one area uh, because uh, there's not proper movement in another uh, region. <clears throat> So when we consider the soft tissue structures, uh, that continuous envelope uh, from dermis to periosteum is something that we're challenged to get at. Um, and we can get at that in a number of different ways. Um, and, and we'll talk about a lot of those, uh, those different strategies as we go through today. But I wanna take a minute and take a close up look at what's happening um, here at Attendant Sheath. So, here, when we can we can appreciate that, you know, tissue is not just sliding and gliding in these independently, um, you know, isolated tracks. Things are, are are sticky. Things are stretchy. Things are connected. Um, and when we move in one area, as I said, it it will affect another. So being able to get at those uh, deep areas, um, those areas that we can't just you know, easily palpate or, or pin with our, our hands and fingers or tools, um, it leads us to consider other ways that we can get into that uh, complex matrix of, um, of collagen. You know, so to do that, um, we want to also appreciate visibly how all this stuff is connected. So I apologize to those of you that have just, uh, you know, settled down to, to eat your steak. Um, but here is a, a, an exploded view of the, um, the upper limb um, and, and uh, scapula. So here, you know, we can appreciate how, um, you know, uh, pec minor is coming off the coracoid there. Um, and here we've got levator scapula. And I think I was talking over this one uh, section I wanted to highlight. But as we move into the, the brachial plexus, coming into biceps um, and there along the um, uh, radial nerve. Uh, the physician here is gonna take and tug on uh, pec major. And we'll see that overlay the front and as we come underneath that, we're gonna come into the brachial plexus. So as he tugs on the brachial plexus, 
you'll see how the movement proximally is affecting tissue that's all the way down into the elbow. Um, that's not because of um, simply just the neural uh, connections, but also the fascial connections that are, are leading um, all the way through that brachial plexus um, and into the distal arm and hand. So when we have an injury or trauma to that tissue, um, you know, we take that beautiful type one collagen that we were born with, and then it kind of gets destroyed. Uh, granulation tissue uh, that we see at the surface or uh, repaired tissue that's happening underneath the surface is going to, uh, to reformulate in a, a type three format. Type three, four, uh, type three collagen is very disorganized. It's very functional in that it's there to close a gap, but it's not there uh, in terms of, uh, it, it's not as uh, uh, resilient and resistant to strain and stress and movement um, as our original uh, triple helix design. So when we have an injury and followed by a period of immobilization or rest, um, as oftentimes is recommended, what happens is tissue can get very clumped together. Uh, it's very much like that spaghetti that sits in your strainer after you've cooked it. If you let it sit too long, everything gets stuck together. Um, and that stickiness is, uh, is what we're oftentimes trying to battle against. If we've had someone that's um, not moved properly after surgery or they've um, sustained uh, a, a tendinopathy that leads to pain, pain leads to uh, lack of motion, um, we get a reduction in the water within the joint, reduction of water within the tissue, um, and things can get very sticky. So dealing with this uh, is really our, our primary concern. When we look at what healthy tissue looks like, you know, with blood flow going through it, oxygen and nutrients getting to the tissues that are in demand, everything's fine. But as things get backed up, they get jacked up. And when they're backed up, muscle can go into spasm. Um, we can have, uh, you know, again, tension or restriction from the fascia that can uh, impede or impair blood flow. Um, and as we create this um, uh, reduction in, in available nutrients, tissue can become ischemic. It can become uh, a, a, a waste factory. Uh, where metabolic waste will, will uh, collect and permeate into the tissue and become a further uh, inflammatory agent or irritant. Um, that then leads to obviously pain. Pain leads to stiffness, leads to lack of movement. And so that cycle continues. We have uh, another situation um, that can occur. So, you know, what we're faced with is, you know, how do we address this or how do we deal with it? Um, and, you know, I've postulated a model here. Uh, this is a framework that I use uh, in my practice um, where it's a blend of both manual and uh, technological um, uh, tools in order to try to help move someone beyond this um, point of inflammation into that of a proliferative phase and then help them uh, through the remodeling. And to say that this is this like super distinct, you know, cut lines, it's, it's not exactly that, uh, but it is something that I try to, to weave in very early on uh, in, in the, the treatment process. So, you know, where we look at things on the outset is I like the use of TECAR, using a TECAR therapy, a high frequency radio stim uh, to provide a deep heat to the tissue to uh, act at a cellular level and open up that cell membrane in order for improved transport of that um, metabolic waste. Um, so to get the waste out, we can get nutrients in. Increasing blood flow to that area and warmth helps to reduce pain. Um, it's a very manual technique that I do. Um, and again, there's a number of studies that show how um, you know, manual contacts uh, can help reduce pain in and of themselves. As we progress into more aggressive treatments such as uh, mechanotherapies, there's a number of different mechanotherapies available. 
Um, obviously, we're going to be talking about uh, the use of shockwave, but there's other tools and techniques such as uh, instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization, or I asked them. Um, you know, that's uh, using uh, tools or instruments to get in and physically deform, mobilize uh, tissue, creating an internal stress uh, that signals that uh, chemical response. Once we've created an increase in blood flow to an area, we need to help create uh, a, an exit strategy. So we need to decongest the tissue through negative pressure therapies. Those can be mechanically assisted. Uh, devices like a lymphotouch uh, can help with that. There's also non-technological uh, strategies uh, using cupping or silicone cups. Me personally, I'm not a huge advocate of static cupping, um, just as I'm not a, a huge advocate of, um, you know, I asked him to, to the point of, of um, bruising and things like that. Um, I'm kind of creating more problems in those situations, but once we've decongested the tissue, we've created a, 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 a flow and flush um, you, you know, mechanism that um, as we get the fluid dynamics corrected, that allows us to then move into more of a uh, photo, photo biostimulation or photobiomodulation mode. Adding energy laser to that uh, area can help accelerate healing and help also with pain uh, management, and then allowing us to move into more movement-based strategies. So this is a very complex slide, but it's really central to understanding how all of these different pieces fit into to my approach. Um, and since you're here to hear from me, I guess you're gonna hear about my approach. So as we're, we're dealing with, um, this approach, you know, we're kind of focusing on sort of four proposed mechanisms that we're trying to interact. One is neurophysiological effects. So, you know, we're all familiar with the Melzack and Wall pain gate theory, and there's a lot of more, you know, there's updated modern concepts, but that one is held pretty steady throughout the years. And, you know, by providing a stimulus, whether it's a soft, friendly, you know, manual contact or the the intensity of a, a shock wave, you know, we're providing a sensory experience that uh, is going to be perceived and should be perceived um, and can be a benefit in helping to reduce pain. Mechanotransduction, that is the concept of using mechanical stress, mechanical loading in order to create a chemical response, all right? In order to get the body to uh, initiate that repair sequence, uh, we have to provide some stress to it. If we're not, the cells turn off, everything just kind of goes into uh, shelter in place mode and we don't get he the healing that's desired. So we need to have some mechanical loading. This concept goes back to the 1890s when it was first uh, published in literature. Next is the, the physical breaking up of crosslinks. Um, and that can occur in a number of different ways. Um, different types of shockwave devices um, have different um, mechanical physiological effects and interactions with the tissue and uh, the degree to which those cross links can, can be broken up uh, varies largely by the, the power uh, density of that shockwave. And then lastly is fluid dynamics. You know, as we get in and mobilize tissue, uh, as we create space, as we soften pulverized tissue, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to get, um, you know, fluid to, to soak into a slab of concrete. But if I take and jackhammer it up really good, break it up, that water is going to flow freely. Of course, concrete's busted. But the point being, we have to be able to soften the tissue in order to improve the fluid exchange that's occurring. If tissue is stiff, and rigid, um, it's not going to uh, allow for that exchange effectively. So as we look at shockwave and sort of the, the background um, uh, of, of, of how shockwave, um, you know, comes into play, you know, it's a non-invasive treatment. Um, it is, is used both for acute and, and chronic management of pain. 
Um, you know, studies have shown how it uh, can improve circulation, improve uh, cellular metabolism, uh, and also stimulate healing. Um, you know, physiologically, you know, we are creating that stress at a cellular level that results in an expression of uh, proteins and the release of those proteins to help improve the resiliency uh, and, and load tolerance of those tissues. Um, I will not read all these slides, um, but rest assured, there's uh, sufficient evidence that, um, that links to this gene expression, um, that uh, the conversion of these sig signals are a cascade of effects. Um, we're really on the front side of it um, by initiating uh, the, the use of the shockwave uh, to create a, um, a meaningful uh, response. Um, and that is regulated by, of course, the intensity of that response. Shockwaves, uh, they are, are basically, uh, in a nutshell, an abrupt uh, change in the, uh, the homeostasis. It's an abrupt change in status quo where we have a rapid rate of rise um, from our baseline uh, to a very high impulse. There is then a, a reflexive um, rebounding of that tissue, uh, and then it returns back to its normal state. Um, so our challenge in uh, selecting the, the appropriate treatment um, frequency can be largely based on what the goals of that treatment are. Uh, am I trying to break up scar tissue? Am I trying to just simply mobilize fascia? Um, or am I trying to pulverize a calcification within a tendon? Different types of shock waves have different um, roles, have different um, features or functions, and it's ideal to try to find the one that matches your, uh, you know, your budget uh, and your intended uh, clinical outcomes. Uh, similarly, when we compare the two, so if we look at, you know, there's two really fundamental types of shock waves. Um, one is focused and one is radial. Um, when we look at them just simply by numbers, we see focused shockwave typically produces um, significantly higher forms of pressure than a radial system does. Um, the radial system is getting at that tissue uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in smaller amplitude, um, more mechanically driven, um, impulses as opposed to one that is focused either acoustically or electromagnetically. Um, to put things in, into perspective, a megapascal, which we have here under the pressure scaling, um, one megapascal is a, a, approximately 145 PSI. Um, so those of you that are cyclists, you know that's about the pressure that's in your high performance bicycle tire. Some other key differences in terms of the pressure field, you know, one, we take a very focused approach. The radial is very divergent. I'll illustrate that in just a moment. Um, you know, and the end effects that we have are slightly different. Um, in a perfect world, you have one of each unit um, because each one has slightly different benefits. Um, but um, what is key is where we see the maximum amount of energy flux. Um, so that max energy flux density uh, is a really big word, um, but I'll illustrate that in just a second with the graphic. So radial shockwave, let's talk about that one first. Um, radial shockwave, uh, it has a, uh, a pressure wave that is generated ballistically. Um, and here in this illustration, you see it's a handheld device. Uh, there's essentially a bullet that's within that chamber that um, rapidly passes back and forth. Um, that is, is essentially like a, a very high-tech hammer uh, to the surface of your tissue. Um, the maximum amount of the effect is felt very close to the tip of the applicator um, because in this case, energy is going to dissipate or diverge as it goes um, distally. When we look at a focused shock wave, Focus shockwave come in a number of different forms. There's electromagnetic 
um, pulses that can be focused into a um, uh, a flux field. There's a hydro uh, or hydraulic uh, principle, the one that we see in the bottom left corner. Um, in, in, and these are extremely powerful um, and are similar to those you know, used for breaking up uh, kidney stones or uh, gallstones. Um, these can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, but there is a, a high, uh, a high voltage spark um, that creates a shock within a enclosed um, bladder of water, uh, and that can create, um, you know, a very focused shock wave there. Uh, drawback to those systems are really just simply cost um, are, are massive, and oftentimes those are the type of shock waves where uh, you're being taken into the uh, into the operating theater and going under anesthesia uh, because it's so incredibly painful. The, I'm going to center most of my talk around the piezoelectric uh, lower energy generators. The the piezoelectric principle um, is where we are um, looking at a very simple system. It's not um, you know, electrically or electromechanically, it's not uh, dissimilar to the, uh, the, the, the handheld ultrasound units that we've used in therapy for many years. The difference is obviously the voltages, um, the, the, the architecture of the unit, but the concept of a piezoelectric crystal where we are passing electricity through a crystal, crystal it's expanding and contracting um, and creating a pulsed wave. We're very familiar with that. Um, what we have here in the, um, in the piezo wave is a focusing of hundreds of little crystals that are all pulsing in unison uh, to create a focused um, uh, sound wave. What happens with this is it gives us a lot more control. Um, we have a, a lot more control of the depth. We also have control over the intensity um, of, uh, of the impulse that the, the patient is actually feeling. Whereas when we look at the energy, what we call energy flux density or the ED max, um, there's a couple important things to consider. So if I'm applying a radial shock wave here at the surface of, of the skin um, and I, I'm going to use this as a, uh, you know, I've got two bones or two other competing structures in there. I have to drive a pretty significant amount of force all the way out here at quite a distance uh, to get to that target tissue. Um, the good thing about radial shock waves is that, you know, the studies show that the shock wave itself that's traveling, and I don't know if you can see my. Um, cursor here, you probably can't. Um, the, can you see my cursor? What if I'm over on this screen? Can you see it now? Ah, all right. So I'm gonna talk over to this screen. So if, if I have the surface of the skin here and I'm sending a shock wave straight down into the tissue, studies show that that shock wave is going to meet at this point without significant um, decrease or uh, diminish. Whereas when we're using a focused shock wave, uh, we have to use a higher, um, a higher energy um, source in order to ensure that that force gets to converge at the depth, um, because we have to work around some of these other objects that may be in the way of the tissue. So you'll notice that on the previous slide, the 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 energy used in the focused shock wave is much higher. Uh, and that does give some people some alarm. Um, but the reality is that um, that is directing that energy at the appropriate target tissue, whereas on the radial side, um, we have to impart a significant amount of energy um, and physical stress to tissue that is far more superficial um, and cannot be as, as well tolerated. So there are some structural disturbances that we need to, to keep in mind as we're applying uh, our shockwave. 
there's trade-offs to each. I'm not going to uh, do a radial shock wave um, right along a joint line. Um, <laughs> my patient's going to slug me. Um, but I can regulate the energy um, with great precision in a focused shock wave so that I can treat a uh, degenerative joint. So when we see them represented visually, um, that same uh, type of argument here, we see where the ED max is going to be right at the surface of the tissue. That's where the maximum energy uh, in a radial is going to impart. Whereas um, using variable depth of the gels um, that, that we can customize to the depth of penetration that we wish to get uh, can actually uh, penetrate as deep as uh, six centimeters. Whereas on average, the radial shock wave is only really effective at penetrating of a depth of approximately two centimeters. So if you're working deep into a hip or uh, whether anterior or posterior, um, trying to get in deep to a thigh bruise, um, you know, it's important to, to, to have a system that's going to get the energy um, and, and the effect to where you want it to be. So those are two examples of a pinpoint a type applicators. Um, there's other things to consider, such as linear. L linear is particularly uh, from an applicator standpoint, is very good at hitting long, um, lengthy, you know, we think of those anatomy trains. Uh, I'm essentially taking a blade of sound or a blade of energy, and I can impart that energy all along um, the path that, that I'm looking to treat. So this is great for treating large areas. Um, and for those of you, if, if any of you are treating pelvic health, we can have a whole separate conversation on how uh, effective the use of linear focus shockwave is on um, the improvement of uh, erectile dysfunction in males. Um, it's, a, it's fascinating. So uh, studies are showing that um, the use of, of acoustic compression therapy for uh, ED is more effective than the use of uh, the nitric oxide uh, medications that uh, we see advertised so uh, prevalently. Again, another talk. Looking at some of the approved standard indications um, in terms of things that we commonly see uh, shockwave being used for are chronic tendinopathies. Again, this is a great way to, to uh, provide a very intense mechanistic um, uh, you know, approach to trigger that um, repair and healing response. You know, with bone pathologies, um, with proper settings, frequencies, intensities can also be uh, very helpful in uh, healing with delayed bone unions. It can be uh, very effective for uh, the management of stress fractures. Um, and also um, where we have um, you know, calcification in tendons uh, where bone is, is, is being laid down there. Um, it can be used in, um, in wound healing, uh, in the, the management of, of uh, burn scar tissue uh, and things uh, such as that as well. When we look at what has been published, a lot of the evidence that's gonna be uh, in those same kind of categories is gonna probably the majority of work has been published on, um, on heel pain, heel spurs, plantar fasciitis um, is probably where we think of it most commonly. And interestingly, here in the States, where studies are showing an 85% effectiveness for the treatment of chronic heel pain, our insurance providers still do not recognize it as a, uh, <laughs> a billable service for the, the management of those. But uh, interesting uh, side note. So some of the common published pathologies, you can take a look at those. The main thing is, you know, in terms of contraindications, you know, whether it's uh, radial or focused waves with low energy, you know, we're not going to do anything over, uh, like obviously, a gravid uterus. Um, we're not going to do anything over any type of um, malignant tumor. Um, there is some 
precautions, you know, when somebody does have an underlying history of either of those, uh, there certainly is a caution that would be exercised in treating something distal. Um, you know, am I going to uh, apply a, a shockwave to someone who is having uh, heel pain or knee pain, but may also be pregnant? Uh, I, I don't, I don't feel uncomfortable with that. Um, but again, we choose every case uh, separately. When we think about high energy shock waves, those are those um, electromagnetic uh, or electromechanical um, types where you actually have the spark and uh, those are, are very high energy um, treatment areas that we typically are gonna be very mindful of. Epiphyseal plates, um, we're not gonna do anything over around the, the brain or uh, directly over the spine, uh, although while we'll work paraspinally, um, you know, it's just, Kind of common sense um, with those. Um, because lung fields are air filled and not water filled, and the whole premise of a shock wave is that it's transmitting um, a pressure wave through the waters within our tissue, um, lung tissue can really cause some problems there. So, um, you know, when that um, uh, you know, lung tissue, when the uh, alve alveoli you know, when it hits the dead end, uh, you can create uh, a real significant problem in the lung. So we, we're very careful to avoid uh, lung tissue, particularly with the focused shock wave. So as we get into treatment and some of the considerations there, things that we want to ask ourselves, you know, what is the depth of the target tissue that we want to get? I mean, if it's superficial, you know, you could have very good success with the radial uh, device. Um, however, the, the physical stress uh, that is is happening at the surface of the tissue, particularly if we're dealing anybody that's a hand therapist. Um, if you've had focused shockwave uh, done to your hand, and you've had radial shockwave done to your hand, I guarantee you, you you will not want to go through that uh, the latter experience again. Um, it, it's it's like having a little hammer peck away uh, at a very sensitive area, and we we want to be careful with that. So depth of tissue is important. Um, if I'm working with a focused shock wave, I have, I have to uh, use different types of gel in order to uh, get the depth appropriate. In terms of identifying tissue depth, if you have the benefit of a diagnostic ultrasound where you can actually view the lesion, where you can measure the depth between the surface and the depth of the, the, the tendon or, or the treatment you're, you're working on, you know, that's only going to enhance your precision and overall, um, you know, uh, clinical outcome. In terms of the size of the tissue, the, you know, I can cover a large amount of area with the linear probe. Uh, I can, I'm going to cover a much smaller uh, treatment area if I'm using a radial device or a pinpoint applicator. Um, so, you know, I need to be mindful of the structures that, that might be in the way. Am I, um, am I shocking over right over a bony prominence? Am I going over a nerve? Um, is there an air-filled uh, space or a water-filled space? Um, you know, those are all going to impact things. One thing that I've found, and this is more my own uh, practice than somebody uh, publishing on, is the position of the limb to optimize that fascial tension. So if I take and put a limb in a, a joint or muscle in a shortened position, uh, that tissue then is on slack. And if tissue's on slack, I think it more readily absorbs the, uh, the shock wave as opposed to if I want to reflect or bounce a shock wave off a tighter tissue. So think of a guitar string. I want to put the, the limb on length or the, the tissue on length in order to get um, a, a greater response. I don't necessarily want to put it on stretch because then I think what happens is the overall tissue tolerance, uh, tension tolerance of the tissue becomes greater than what the shock wave can overcome. So there is what I would say is a sweet spot uh, of the range within which uh, I'll position somebody. Certainly things like if there's diminished sensation, if you've got somebody with diabetic neuropathy, 
uh, I'm not going to go shocking the heck out of their plantar surfaces for any reason um, because they can't give me proper feedback. Um, so that falls into that precaution uh, uh, category. Somebody may have diabetes, but they have intact sensation. I'll be mindful of, of how I'm treating them and probably err to lower intensities. And then lastly, the chronicity of symptoms. If someone's had a longstanding chronic uh, Achilles tendinopathy, I will be much more likely to be more aggressive, um, you know, probably at treatment two or three. Uh, treatment one, still want to gain their trust, uh, but will then gradually increase my intensity as um, we see how they respond to the initial uh, treatment. When we look at dosing, you know, it depends on a lot of things. I mean, obviously the stage of the healing that a patient is at. Um, if you remember back to my early graphic, um, I'll probably do more uh, aggressive therapy early on in the acute phase. So when I say aggressive, I may do more uh, pulses, but a lower intensity, um, depending on how in, you know, inflamed or reactive they are. Um, it's hard to put those things in a slide because it's something you kind of have to feel and experience with the patient. Um, you know, the, the, the area of the anatomy that we're treating, if I'm treating along uh, a spiral line, like working along sartorius into uh, gracilis semitendinosus down into the pes, or along a um, TFL and IT band complex, you know, that's gonna influence the, the way that I treat them. How many pulses, how intense, uh, and what applicator. Um, generally, uh, while there's some studies that do go up to 5,000, I would say that typically my dosage is in the um, 1,800 to 2,400 pulses um, you know, uh, per session. And I'm generally using a frequency of five uh, six at the low side five, but generally six to eight uh, hertz. In terms of frequency of, of treatments, you know, the frequencies are going to depend on a lot of things. I mean, some patients I see will travel, you know, an hour to two hours to, to come for care. Um, so, you know, I may only see them once a week. Uh, I have you know, football players, professional athletes uh, that will come. I may see them as many as three times a week, you know, for more frequent facilitation. I tend to not do back-to-back, -back, uh, you know, treatments day after day, because again, we're stressing tissue, not indifferent to stressing someone with exercise. Um, you know, there's not been a lot published on high frequency uh, care. And, you know, certainly I don't wanna be the guy that um, creates a, a, a tendon rupture or something like that in a multi-million dollar athlete. So uh, I don't push the, the boundaries more than uh, three times a week. Um, that's my opinion. In terms of uh, taking a look at some of the different, uh, let me see if I can get this video to play. And of course it won't play here. It's, there we go. Uh, so taking a look at some, um, These are some of the, the gel pads that show the different uh, thickness or, or difference uh, variation in the, the surface that we can treat at. Um, but, you know, coming in and working in and around um, glute medius or TFL, you know, if we're working in that uh, lateral hip complex, you know, we're going to obviously expose the area for the, the patient to be treated in. Um, you know, some of the different settings that we'll use in um, I know while this came off of a uh, one of their standard, I, I don't take a lot of video uh, of me treating people with it because it's really not uh, all that exciting to, to look at, but I uh, wanted to give you a couple um, uh, visual representations. You know, what Kevin is doing here, one of our therapists is uh, just taking in, once we identify the focus or uh, area that we want to treat, we'll then take in um, just sort of like alter slight little angulations as we're sort of moving that um, maximum energy 
uh, uh, maximum uh, energy flux, um, uh, you know, area that that treatment area around uh, at that. When we look at um, you know piriformis again, we're taking and looking at um, what I think the focus shock wave does particularly well is getting in at um, this is fun with two screens. Let me try this. There we go. So, sorry. I'm going to get mocked for my video prowess here. <laughs> Just do that. Let's try one more time. There we go. Um, never fails. So, I find that the most effective, um, you know, when we're, when we're working myofascially is to try to get uh, along the line of that fascial plane, but then also uh, take and pinpoint. So I may do a linear along a long area, but then I'll do pinpoint treatments um, as they are specific to the, um, the insertion and origin uh, at the tenoperiosteal junction of that muscle. Um, so here, this is just working a little bit more laterally. Um, and again, it's a subtle difference between uh, the prior um, viewpoint, um, but working until we find the, the, the area of the, uh, uh, of the pain generator that is reactive to the shock wave. And then once we get on that area, then we'll start to just take and gently oscillate around, migrate around that area. Um, again, total treatment time for me takes uh, really no more than uh, five to 10 minutes uh, to deliver the 1800 to 2400 pulses that we'll typically do in that in that area. Um, generally, we'll do a test retest, see how how movement felt before treatment, and then provide the treatment and then do a, a follow up movement to see how that uh, feels. Um, and in terms of complementary care, um, Again, as you saw in my early graphic, um, you know, this is not something that uh, just I do as a standalone. Um, you know, we're, we're providing a comprehensive um, uh, approach to, to their problems. So my end goal is to get them exercising and, and, and moving, right? Um, but to do that, we might uh, also bring in uh, stretching. There might be manual therapy manipulation. Uh, there may be negative pressure therapies, uh, kinesiology taping, orthotics. Th there's a lot of different things that come into play. Um, and again, you know, we're seeing it happen here in the U.S. I know it's much more advanced uh, in the practice in the U.K. Just the, the integration and prevalence of uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound to identify areas. Um, and and uh, we do use them in our practice here. Um, it's it's one of those things that we have committed to that process uh, about eight eight or nine years ago. Largely uh, more on the, the patient education and kind of being able to show and share with them, you know, where the the mechanical fault or the structural fault is in tissue, uh, and then we'll go in and, and work on it. Um, so that's a, a nice adjunct to this as well. So in summary, you know, there's you know, pain in the pain process is a multifactorial and complex set of um, considerations. Um, you know, the things that, that we're dealing with um, and where I think that um, that Shockwave plays a, a, an important role is um, helping to identify uh, some of those uh, pain generators and, and replicate that. You know, oftentimes, you know, patient will say, yeah, like, I mean, it hurt yesterday, but now it's not bothering me as much. The nice thing about a, uh, a focus shockwave is it is not disruptive to healthy tissue. So t tissue that is non-reactive, um, I, I can run over it with maximum power 
and I don't feel a thing. But the minute, the second that you find that weakness in the tissue or that inflammatory uh, generator, pain generator, you know, someone will light up. It's an exquisite um, experience and different in the sense that the radial, you're feeling so much surface uh, disruption and so much discomfort right at the surface of the skin that it can sometimes be difficult to feel whether or not you've actually hit the right spot or not. So um, I, I like to think that there's a little bit more precision uh, using a focused uh, shockwave uh, than, than that of the radial. When we look at evidence though, and this is the, the thing that's always a challenge for the companies and the, and the people trying to sell it, you know, the outcomes uh, are not entirely differentiated. So in terms of the clinical outcomes of somebody using radial versus shockwave, you, you quite honestly won't find um, a, a shocking difference between those two. It then starts to come down into patient experience, provider practice, and some of the other considerations um, you know, that factor in to your practice. You know, do you want to differentiate yourself from other people? You know, most of the patients, like when I suggest uh, that we're gonna do shockwave, if they've ever had it before, most will say, yeah, you're not coming near me with that thing again. And that's me. You know, so my personal experience with, with uh, shockwave uh, started probably about six or seven years ago um, with my own history of uh, uh, osteochondral defect in my knee, pain associated with running, developed compensatory strategy. And uh, a friend of mine said, hey, I got this new shockwave. You got to check it out. And I swear he put it up on 10 and just, and it was a radial device. Um, it was brutal. It was like the worst pain I ever felt. It was like dental surgery without Novocaine. And it worked. I mean, yeah, I had no pain. Um, I, it was awful. Um, and about six months later, pain came back. And at that, it was at that point I was kind of looking for a clinical solution because I thought, well, I need to fix myself <laughs> because I'm the knee guy and I can't be having pain. So I started looking at alternatives uh, and I came across a focus shockwave. Um, and uh, was treated with it, and it was night and day difference. S still shocking, but the the level of precision that um, and and just the overall feeling, it was kind of then it was a no brainer. Now, granted, things we also had to look at in terms of the the, the budgeting process and purchase. You know, I mean, you know, it, it takes a little bit longer to hit the ROI. Um, but quite honestly, um, we do that through volume of treatment because more and more people are getting that treatment built within their care um, at a lower price than the few people that would have done it uh, with radial. So considerations, budget, preference, philosophy, you know, if, if you know, equipment breakdown and serviceability, you know, the reliability is, there's very few working mechanical parts on a, on a focus shockwave. Um, it's all mechanical on a radial shockwave. So you're replacing heads, the breaking down, uh, those, those are just things to consider. Um, and, you know, too, from, from the, the linear standpoint, we do have a, a, a growing pelvic health practice. And in that, um, you know, the, the need and use for something that can be, um, that can get in effectively in and around um, abdominal adhesions, um, you know, in helping with uh, erectile dysfunction in males, um, recovery after post-prostatectomy surgeries and, and things like that. So um, for us, more versatility um, ultimately became one of the deciding factors. So at the end, it really becomes more about the why not versus the why. Um, it, it's a lot, uh, it, it's impossible for me to think of uh, opening a clinic, uh, we have 10 um, at this point without this device. Um, 
wouldn't do it. So um, I think that's, uh, for the most part, that's what I have to say. Um, this is my email. Um, feel free to email me directly if you have any questions. Obviously, we'll try to answer them here. Um, I'm happy to provide, again, unfiltered. Um, I'm biased in the sense that it's what we use and it's what works um, and it's what we feel most comfortable with. Um, but that's uh, the bias is our practice. Um, so yeah, that's me. Feel free to email me. Um, if you have any questions, if you've not done so already, please uh, go ahead and populate those in the question and answer session. And then I'll turn back over to Dom on uh, some upcoming courses. I mean, you've, you've literally just taken my line there, Ken. It was um, my, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we do, we have had a, a question, a couple of questions pre-submitted as well. Uh, we've got about five, 10 minutes. Um, so if you do have any questions on the content that, that Ken's covered, uh, then please pop it in. Otherwise, like I say, um, we can get it answered after if anything pops up after the session. Um, so we've had a question coming, Ken, uh, it's about, I'm, I'm presuming it's around shockwave, what the comorbidities are to the treatment option uh, from, from D. Um, uh, it did come in at a particular point. I think showing about com comorbidities to shockwave treatment. Um, any comments on that? And part of it is that I may not understand the, the question. When we say comorbidities to this treatment option. I don't know if, it's, I don't know if she's meaning like sort of secondary effects. Um, I mean, yeah. if we take it as that and we'll answer. answer oh, yeah, honestly, that's a great, uh, very good question now that I understand it. <laughs> So a couple of things I could tell you from experience. One, uh, I did have a professional figure skater for that I was treating for SI joint pain. Um, and um, shortly after the treatment, uh, yeah, I, I knew obviously she wasn't um, pregnant or anything. She did report to me that she had some uh, very minor spotting uh, after her treatment and so she texted me like the next day, like, ooh, is this normal? Um, which no, it, it, it really isn't or shouldn't be. Although if someone does have a sensor, sensitive uterine lining, you, know, you can uh, you know, create potentially some bleeding there. Um, in this particular case, it was just happened to be right around that time. And it was just more of a timing thing as opposed to the actual treatment. Uh, so that is what we ultimately did conclude there. Um, other things I did have, and this comes from a colleague of mine in Australia that is working with, uh, with Shockwave, uh, where she was actually treating along the, um, uh, the sternocleidomastoid and got particularly close to the mastoid process. And uh, she had a patient who did, and, and part of it is, I don't think necessarily Shockwave, but maybe the technology so the uh, piezo wave has a, a clicking sound, a click, 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 when it um, is, is firing. And I think that combined with it being right close to the ear um, kind of created a, a short-term tinnitus that lasted uh, for a couple of weeks. Um, so that could be, uh, you know, uh, something to consider. But in terms of... Um, you know, honestly, I mean, I've been using it for a number of years. I, I would characterize the the limbs and areas treated in the thousands. Um, I I really can't say that the treatment uh, that I delivered uh, that that people came back with like any type of adverse response. Um, the the last thing that I would say though to be probably cautious on, and I probably need to add this into the slides, is if somebody has been on uh, certain antibiotics, or, you know, like um, the quinolones, the uh, fluoroquinolones, those, those can be uh, disruptive to uh, the, the collagen within the, the tendon and can lead to a weakening. Uh, so in those cases, I would not shockwave, you know, over a, a tendon that's, um, you know, had those. That yeah. Happen. Um, just add on to that because so D is just asking about treating with cancer patients um like if, if they've got any kind of active cancers I'd steer clear and um, just because it's the evidence is showing with the particularly focused shockwave it stimulates growth factor pathways and it's stimulating cellular growth 
uh, which is something we want to avoid with cancer, uh, regardless of whether you're near the cancer site at all. I think if uh, it's just not worth the risk. Um, and I think anything where stimulating more tissue growth um, is not desired, I, I think you just steer clear. Um, it's one of those things, isn't it? It's just like, if in doubt, don't. Um, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, you just your best judgment. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a risk reward. Um, and is the risk really worth, you know, the potential reward for that treatment? And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I've got a world-class sprinter um, that, you know, treating a uh, Achilles tendinopathy, I felt comfortable treating Achilles tendinopathy because the cancer was far removed from that area. Um, you know, and, you know, we clear those things with the physician as well. And we have a conversation mm -hmm. with, with them. Um, you know, again, it worked, but those are the conversations you have with somebody. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be treating a, a piriformis or SI joint if I know somebody's got some type of, um, you know, prostate situation going on. Yeah. Oh, I mean, with the pain aspects, obviously we get localized pains, we get referred pains. And, you know, if patients new into you, is that your first port of call? It's just like, right, you're in pain. We're going to deal with that. Or, and then it's, and then looking at what could be causing that in terms of the myofascial structures, or are you looking at potential problems first and then treating pain? Like what's, what's your process? That's a, that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I would say that you know, first, obviously, a thorough musculoskeletal evaluation is performed. So we're looking for, you know, the movement dysfunction uh, first. Pain is a, is, a, is a symptom, but not, not necessarily, it's not a cause, right? So we're always trying to find, figure out what the cause is. And when we can relate the cause with the structure and the function, um, then dealing with the pain becomes, I think, much more manageable. Um, so there's a fair amount of education, I think, that goes into play with why we do what we do. Um, and yeah, I would say it kind of goes there, but just somebody coming in saying, oh, I have pain in my right elbow. I don't just immediately jump into shockwave. I mean, we kind of go through our, you know, standard process. So, um, and, and uh, Miriam asked a, a very similar good question, which is, you know, how do we identify those treatment areas? Um, and yeah, we would certainly we palpate uh, those areas. But what's interesting is sometimes we'll find areas as we're treating around or moving because I feel like it, particularly in the, the pinpoint applicator can be sometimes somewhat diagnostic. Um, there's been times when, you know, I'll kind of think I'm in the right area. And as, especially sometimes dealing with myofascial pain because myofascial pain can sometimes be referred you know, I may wind up treating, uh, and a good example was, um, you know, in, with one of the football clubs I consulted with, uh, you know, when you get a lower frequency, high intensity, linear, acoustic, uh, focused, acoustic uh, pressure wave on a, an IT band, approximately, you'll see things distally. It's, it's actually very interesting. Um, so the, the pain may be, you know, down at the lateral knee, um, but we can actually treat and get a, uh, a trigger point uh, up much higher uh, in glute medius or TFL. So, so, yeah, I mean, the luxury mode is where you, you piece together your musculoskeletal uh, assessment, the symptomology, you take out your diagnostic ultrasound, you can visualize that area. Um, and then obviously you go in for the kill. Um, that's, a, that's a phrase, isn't it? <laughs> that's the phrase, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it is. On it's, that actually, you know, like fine. We're, we're, we're constantly trying to, you know, it, it's sort of us against pain, right? Mm. And, and it, yeah. is, um, it is that challenge that drives us to do what we do every day. We want people to feel better. Um, and selfishly i want to be the person that did it better than anybody else um and that's oh, of course that's what we all want to do <laughs> i think with the pain aspect as well obviously if you get into pain science i mean that's a real rabbit hole isn't it of of information i mean shockwave shock um research enough i mean you, you mentioned it there with a lot of the research 
being you know sometimes contradictory um but on the you know on the on the, on the pain front we had an example of where we actually scanned it we found the depth of, of where the injury was but the pain was actually about two inches um, more proximal to where it was where the, the actual spasm um, was happening and the actual trauma of the tissue there was no pain response with shockwave but it was two inches higher or more proximal to the injury so i think it's, it's quite an interesting um, area talking about pain you can go you can go around in circles with it really um just one sort of i think we've got probably time for one more question um is just regards to like a, maybe just a little bit on the science side of things from a pain aspect have you seen any evidence around substance p and the shockwave being able to reduce levels is it having any effect on the actual nervous system we talked a bit about pain gate but have you seen anything anything around that that's a good question i mean i i'd love to be able to whip out my uh you know bibliography in my head you know, substance P is an interesting um, subject. I mean, that is, you know, it is kind of that um, uh, endogenous, uh, you know, local pain reliever that, you know, we do see that, um, you know, expressed when we're doing soft tissue mobilization with tools and, and things like that. And I think that it certainly can have, um, I think it can play a role, but I, I, I can't cite reference in verse. Um, you know, a study that looked at that. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I, I was trying no, to- No, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting area. I think like you say, you could dive into the, into the rabbit hole with that kind of thing, but look, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. I think, I think there's a lot of people probably, I mean, you want to crack on with your day and um, people wanting dinners and things. So uh, as you've got up on, on the screen now, um, we do have some upcoming webinars um, in the near future, uh, one being around the uh, shockwave therapy and diagnostic ultrasounds. So this is a product meeting, so if you're wanting to find out more specifically about Focus Shockwave, um, join us on that session and you can learn uh, more about the technical aspects of the technology uh, and find out a little bit more how about it could fit into your practice. And then in the new year, uh, I can't believe we're there already. So 20th of January, it's Shockwave. And we're going to translate the research into practice. So there's loads of research out there in the world. Um, and it's being able to take that information and put that into um, some really clear, um, objective ways of how that can be put into the real world and real life practice. So if you're interested in those, we'll send that out in a survey at the end of this webinar. Um, if you can take some time to fill in that survey, that'd be fantastic. And any suggestions on further topics would be great as well. Um, like we've said a couple of times, if you do have any further questions or if you're watching the recording of this session and you do have any questions, please feel free to email them in. Our email, email is info at physiquip.com. Uh, with, uh, with that all being said, Ken, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and going through the, all that information for us. It's really, really interesting. Um, and I'd like to say thank you very much for everybody for joining, in this, joining us this evening. Uh, everybody, stay safe and well and have a very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year from ourselves and everybody at PhysiQuip and I'm sure Ken as well from the States. Thank you very much, guys. Have a good evening. Cheers.